Welcome to the 2018-19 South Carolina High School League online rules presentation. My name is Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner at the South Carolina High School League. I'll be reviewing the first 10 slides which pertain to South Carolina High School League information only. At the conclusion of the first 10 slides, the Commissioner responsible for your sport will then take over and go through the rule changes that pertain to your sport for the 2018-19 school year. Contact information for the South Carolina High School League is on the first slide. Phone number is 798-0120, area code of 803. We're in the office from the hours of 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday from August through May. In the months of June and July, we are closed on Fridays. South Carolina High School League website was updated last year www.schsl.org. Any information you want to find on the National Federation, you would go to the National Federation website, which is nfhs.org. And all the courses that we're going to talk about in these first 10 slides that are required of coaches to take can be found at www.nfhslearn.com. In addition to the required courses of coaches, there are also sports specific coaching courses, sportsmanship course as well as a host of other educational opportunities at nfhslearn.com. Highly encourage you all to take a moment to look at the available courses and to take any courses that interest you or that can further educate you in your sport. Our five approved healthcare professionals that can return an athlete to play with symptoms of a concussion or diagnosing of a concussion, an MD, a DO, a PA, an MP or an athletic trainer. Athletic trainer is probably the most common available to every school throughout the state during the entire school year. It's often the case you may have an MD or a DO on the sideline during a football game. In absence of one of these five, if an athlete suspected of having a concussion, the official is going to send them off the field and they are not to return under any circumstance. If they're sent off for concussion-like symptoms and one of these five healthcare professionals is present, they can test and diagnose and return to play or test, diagnose, and sit out. But remember, in absence of one of these five, student athlete will sit out. Remember the old saying we've used for years, when in doubt, sit them out. Don't ever risk an athlete's help over the opportunity to win a game. Coaching requirements. South Carolina High School League requires all coaches at all levels to take the following three courses. Concussion course, heat acclimatization course, and the sudden cardiac arrest course. These three courses are not new. They've been required for the last two years. The concussion course has been in place for a number of years now. Uh, if you've been uh, coaching for a while, you understand that occasionally these courses get updated. The concussion course has been updated for this year with some new information added to it so it should have a little different feel when you watch it this year well, in some areas. When you get done with these courses, print out your certificate, give them to your athletic director or principal to keep on file so that you have proof you've taken these courses. Reminder, that's for all coaches at all levels. If they're a volunteer coach, required to take them. If they're there one day a week, required to take them. Full-time paid, required to take it. Middle school only, required to take these. All coaches must take these one time each year. These should be done prior to the first day of practice. In addition to the three required courses this year, all coaches are now required to be certified in, a in CPR and AED certification. If you remember last year, head coaches, all head coaches were required to be CPR and AED certified. This year, all coaches at all levels. Again, that includes volunteers, those that are there one day, those that are there just for games, middle school coaches, sub-varsity coaches are required to be CPR certified in addition to um, the uh, required online courses you must view. Coaches, this is nothing new. For athletic directors have known about this um, since last year. We 
we made it known that the head coaches were required last year, but moving forward, all coaches would be required. So this is nothing new. If you have any questions on CPR AD certifications, speak to your athletic director. If you're a non-district employee and you're a head coach, reminder that you must take the fundamentals of coaching course in addition to all the requirements we've gone over already. Fundamentals of coaching course can be found at nfhslearn.com. Make sure you select fundamentals of coaching and select South Carolina so that you don't take a fundamentals of coaching course for another state. Again, when you get, complete that course, print your certificate out, give it to your athletic director or principal to keep on file. Okay, some general reminders for all head coaches. Beginning the 2018-19 school year, a wet bulb globe thermometer must be used throughout the year. Um, this instrument will help determine safe conditions in times of high heat and humidity. Again, this is required. For those of you that coach an indoor sport or at different times outside of the fall, please understand this is not isolated to just a football practice or a cross-country practice or an outdoor practice in the fall. High heat and humidity could be present inside of a gymnasium with no air conditioner. It could also show itself through the winter months or through the spring given the extreme changes in temperature that we have in our state. If you have an athletic trainer, please take a moment before your season starts to become familiar with what a wet bulb globe reading is and the options that you have when it's determined that conditions are not safe to practice full out. If you have any questions, please visit our website. On our website, you'll be able to find uh, the wet bulb globe guidelines in the event that your reading requires you to modify your practice in some way. Again, this is a safety issue that's put in place this year in an effort to reduce the opportunity for heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Don't jeopardize an athlete's health under any circumstances. Again, for 2018-19, Rawlings balls must be used in the postseason. The only exception for this are in sports of football, lacrosse, golf, and tennis. If your sport requires the use of Rawlings balls, please plan accordingly and have balls readily available in the event you host a home playoff game. The balls should be used throughout the contest. You're responsible for making sure that you have quality balls to start the contest with. This is nothing new. We've been doing this for the last couple years. Reminder, Rawlings balls must be used in the postseason. Communicate with your opponents, your start times, your play dates, and your locations. Often, many coaches make schedules six to eight months in advance. Sometimes there's coaching changes at schools. Often people make changes inadvertently in their schedule without notifying everyone. So prior to your season starting, please take a moment, communicate with all of your opponents, head coaches, and athletic directors to verify that you have the correct play date, start time, and location. A number of issues throughout our league in the last few years where schools have shown up at different locations to play each other, where simple communication prior to could have avoided any conflicts the day of. So take a few minutes, communicate, and get it all squared away. Coaches don't rely on other coaches, your peers, coaches other schools, coaches in your region to answer questions about the league. If you have a question about the league as it pertains to the rules and regulations, the bylaws or the constitution or the brackets, ask your AD or principal first. If he or she does not know the answer to your question, have them call us. Remember, the only interpretation that's the official interpretation comes from our league. We've had a ton of changes to our bylaws and regulations in the last few years. Many times coaches who have been coaching for a number of years don't recognize all the changes that have been made and may lead you down a wrong path inadvertently. All coaches are responsible for knowing what is in the South Carolina High School League handbook 
make sure that if you don't know the answer to a question, you ask your AD or principal first. If they can't answer the question, have them call us. And remember, all official interpretations come out of our office. Continue with general reminders. Make sure your officials have clean, secure dressing facilities, optimal space to move around. The biggest thing is that they're clean and they're able to be secured during the contest. And if you have a contest, please make sure that you have some sort of security opportunity for the officials to get escorted back to their vehicles or out of the stadium or facility. That security could be an athletic administrator or an administrator at your school or your game manager in the event you don't have uniform security available. But you need someone to be able to help escort those officials to a secure location and then to their vehicles when the contest is over. This day and age where parents and fans are increasingly becoming vocal about their displeasure for officiating, we don't need any situations where officials are being bombarded post-contest because security was not offered. Social media. Remember, negative comments about officials, other schools, other fan bases, or the South Carolina High School League will not be tolerated on social media. If you have a school account, whether it's ran by a student or ran by a parent or ran by a school employee, that makes these negative comments and you will be responsible for those comments as a school. Coaches and athletes who have their own personal accounts, any negative comments about officials or other schools or other fan bases could subject you to a fine and or other punishments accordingly from the rules and regulations. Remember, keep social media clean and keep it positive. Living Clean Weeks. A Living Clean Weeks initiative we started three years ago. This will be the third year of this initiative. We have three weeks, one in each sports season. You can see the dates here in front of you. Our goal for these three weeks is that we're ejection-free statewide and that each school participates in a community-wide cleanup. On the ejection-free piece, the idea here is that you spend time as a coach leading up to the week in your season that's ejection-free really promoting the importance of positive sportsmanship and being ejection free. Our goal is that every school in the state will go through that week without an ejection of any kind. The second piece to the goal is a community-wide cleanup. We want to be our schools to be intentional about their efforts in their community to help clean up their community. We certainly don't discourage you from going to the elementary school and reading to students, opening car doors, doing canned food drives, gathering clothes for the homeless, but those are not community-wide cleanups. Community-wide cleanups would entail cleaning up your school grounds full of litter, finding someone in the community who needs help restoring their property, participating in a Palmetto Pride event such as Adopt a Highway, Combine these two in schools that combine ejection-free and community-wide cleanup with their athletes are determined a gold school for that week. If you do one of the two, you're determined to be a silver school. And if you have an ejection and don't do any community-wide cleanup, you're, you get no recognition for that week. Our goal is to have all member schools listed each week. Okay, an update for you is that uh, for those of you that are familiar with our system, Planet HS, that handled all of our eligibility, uh, pitch counts in baseball, transfers, uh, Planet HS is now Arbiter Athlete, which I'm sure you're aware of because you had to go to Arbiter Athlete to view this online rules clinic. But understand that Planet HS no longer exists. They have merged with Arbiter Sports and are, are now Arbiter Athlete. For those of you coaches who are familiar with Arbiter Game as it pertains to your game officials assignments and who will and will not be working your contest, while it's under the same umbrella of Arbiter, it's not the same system. 
So you can't just go to your Arbiter Game website where your officials are located and get all the information that's in Arbiter Athlete. Same family of company, different websites. Please keep that in mind as you move forward through the school year. Ejections. I'll quickly walk you through the process of what happens when you have a student athlete who is ejected from a contest. So you're at a contest, you have a student athlete or a coach who's ejected from a contest. Game's over, match is over. First thing you really need to do as a head coach is you need to notify either your principal or your athletic director that someone was ejected from your team. High probability is that they're going to get a phone call or an email from us immediately the next morning making them aware they had an ejection in the contest before. I can tell you as the person that deals with ejections every day in our office, 40% of the time ADs and coaches are not aware. Do yourself, do your school's favors by making your AD and or principal aware that you had an ejection during the contest as soon as your contest is over or first thing the next morning. Schools are required to submit the form for an ejection by noon the following day. In absence of you submitting a form, we don't have anything to go by from the school side. Too often than not, schools will call and say, we were waiting to see what the official said to turn our report in. That's not how this works. We need to know your side of it and the official side so that we can best come to a decision. We don't need to know your story after you read the official story. If you know your student athlete was guilty of an objectionable offense, just say, I know they were guilty. They deserve to be ejected. It's not going to cause more punishment than they already were going to get in the first place. It just makes the whole process a little bit easier on our end. When you write your reports, make sure you report facts, not opinions. Video everything. There's no excuse in this day and age not to have video. Almost every sport uses technology of some sort to practice or re record stats or to record keep. It takes little to no effort to set up a video camera and record a wide angle of the entire field or court during a contest. Instruct your videographers, don't turn the camera off. Keep it running. Football coaches, biggest problem we run into every year is that camera operators, as soon as the player that has the ball is tackled or the play is blown dead, videographers stop the play. Understandably, you want to be able to cut your video so that you don't have one play that lasts for four quarters. But tell those videographers to allow for two to three yards of separation of every player before turning off the camera. If an incident were to break out in any sport where the videographer knows the camera is off, tell them to turn it back on immediately so the video can capture as much information needed for the investigation. Many times this past year alone, we've had numerous athletes ejected from contests that were disputed due to fights or altercations. Without video, we have to go with what the official says happened. Don't leave it up in the air. Video can exonerate you if you were not guilty. The most important thing we have, we want to get those that were guilty, but we also want to get those that were innocent cleared to play. Once we come to a ruling, we will send that ruling to the principal as soon as possible. Okay, piggybacking on ejections, remember the penalties or an ejection. If you're a coach and you're ejected, whether you're a head coach or an assistant coach, you're ejected during the regular season or the postseason, the penalty is a minimum next game suspension and a minimum fine of $300. If you're ejected from the last contest of the year as a head coach, that penalty becomes a $500 fine. Coaches, again, being the person that deals with ejections on a daily basis, I can tell you, once you've been ejected by an official, however rightly or wrongly you feel it was, 
the best thing you can do is walk away. The worst thing you can do is continue to engage that official in any capacity. Walk away from the situation, move on, and let us deal with the ejection the next day. If it was wrongfully ejected, we'll reinstate you. But don't do anything to create a situation where the fine is going to go up and the game suspension is going to go up. All you can do by arguing further is increase your opportunities for your minimum next game to become two, three, four, five, or six games or your minimum fine to increase to 400, 500, 600, however high we have to go. Don't give yourself the opportunity for those increases. Another informational point, coaches, is that almost every sport requires two opportunities for you to make bad decisions to become ejected. And if you know you've got a personal foul, or you know you've got a technical, or you know you've been warned, or you know you've been given a yellow card, be mindful of that as you move yourself through the rest of the contest. Be mindful of that once you get that first warning. Don't continue in anger and to continue to berate the officials and be upset because they got you again really quick. Don't give them an opportunity to do anything. Make it really easy on yourself. Talk to your kids. Coach your kids from that point only. Don't reference the officials. Don't question the officials. Don't argue. Don't get loud. Don't give yourself another opportunity to get that second penalty. If you do that, you'll stay around in almost every contest. Reminder, player ejections. In the sports of football, lacrosse, competitive cheer, and swim, any player who is ejected will be subject to a minimum next game suspension. In all other sports, the minimum becomes two games. Again, football, competitive cheer, swim, and lacrosse is a minimum next game. In all other sports, it's a minimum next two games. Remember, that is the immediate next game and the immediate next two games. Sometimes timing is, uh, is unfortunate for our student athletes. The next game may be homecoming. The next game may be senior night. The next game may be the semis in the state finals. Timing is unfortunate. The decision to be unsportsmanlike was a choice the student athlete made. Unfortunately, choices have consequences. When they choose to be unsportsmanlike, the consequence comes with game suspension. Remind your athletes, those are the minimums. We've had a number of issues this past year where student athletes were using profanity and disrespectfully addressing officials. This is not going to be tolerated by our office or the league. Student athletes who are using profanity towards the officials will get more than the minimum. Make them aware. Do not disrespectfully address the game official and do not use profanity towards a game official. We would not allow a student in a school to use profanity towards a school administrator with no consequence. During an athletic contest, the official is recognized as the authority figure on the, on the field or court. We will not allow them to use profanity or disrespectfully address game officials. Reminder, coaches who are ejected, you must leave the visual confines immediately and not return. Visual confines does not mean you walk and stand behind the bleachers where you don't think you can be seen. You leave where they can't see you, period. Athletes who are ejected may remain in the bench area for the remainder of the contest. On every let an athlete be sent to the locker room unattended. Athletes are allowed to remain in the area unless they become a further distraction at which point the official could ask you to remove them from the bench area. But athletes who are ejected may remain from the bench area. Further, athletes who are suspended because of their ejection may be on the sideline or in the bench area of the games they're suspended provided they are not in uniform. As long as they're not in uniform, they can remain in the bench area or on the sidelines of games they're suspended. 
If they're in uniform, remember they are considered having played in the contest. Coaches and athletes, remember you are not cleared to play until our office has cleared you to play. Anyone who is ejected, anyone who is suspended due to an ejection is not cleared to play until we have cleared you. Don't assume that it's going to be voided or overturned. If you've been ejected, they sit out until we've cleared them to play. Okay, beginning this year, the open closed season schedule as you've known it for the past four or five years no longer exists. South Carolina High School League had a sports season review committee composed of principals and athletic directors across each classification. That committee worked from July of 2017 through April of 2018, formulating um, sports season review proposals. Part of that proposal was the open and closed season practice schedule. Another piece of that proposal was the number of contests, which we'll go over in the next slide. Understand it's important for you to know that all schools had an opportunity to provide input throughout the year at classification meetings. Our classification gave each member of the sports season review committee an opportunity to share with the classifications what they were doing, what, op what options they had decided or come up with at that point in time. And every AD had an opportunity and every principal had an opportunity to go back to their coaches and share this information to get feedback. This was not a one week or one month wonder that was put together in a hurry. This process took time and the committee worked very hard to iron out where we are now. Again, all schools had an opportunity for input throughout the year through your principal and athletic director. So with that being said, our new open and closed practice schedule is as follows. All sports will be allowed 20 days of practice during your open season. Football and lacrosse will be given 10 days in pads. So if you're in the sport of football or lacrosse, 10 of your 20 days may be in pads. All other sports, you have 20 days of practice during your open period to use as you see fit. Schools are responsible for having the file day, on file the dates you used, so the dates that you practiced during your open period, you need to have on file so that your athletic director has them in the event they're questioned. I encourage you to have this on file because chances are most of your Parents will be the ones that will challenge you, or a disgruntled parent or someone in the community will be the one that challenges that you practice more than 20 days. Remind the open and closed season schedule cannot be mandatory. You cannot use it as a tryout period, and you cannot make cuts. You have no limit with how many athletes you can work with during these 20 days. The open season dates, if you're a fall sport, your open season dates for this school year will be May 1st through 31, 2019. Your winter sports will be September 10th through October 24th, 2018. And if you're a spring sport, you have December 3rd, 2018 through January 23rd, 2019 to get your 20 days of practice in. Again, you have those periods to get your 20 days of practice in. Spring sports and winter sports, there's a four-day dead period or closed period prior to your season starting. So in other words, winter sports you have till October 24th, which I believe is a Wednesday, and then that Thursday through Sunday will be closed again until you open up official team practice on Monday. Spring sports will be the same. January 23rd should be a Wednesday. And then you have Thursday through Sunday, which is closed prior to your season opening on Monday. Fall, obviously, you have May 1 through 31, which then rolls right into June 1 through your closed period four-day prior, which is the South Carolina Athletic Coaches Association Clinic in late July. 
So your fall sports, you have May 1 through 31, and then roll right into your summer practice months. During a closed season, sports-specific skills may not be taught. Only strength and conditioning programs can be ran during closed seasons. Now remember, strength and conditioning can include agility programs provided they're not sports-specific skills. The change to the open and closed season practice schedule will have no impact as it pertains to the 75% rule for outside teams. So there's no change in your ability to run an outside team provided you follow the 75% rule. I'm getting a lot of calls on that from coaches in the first few months of this coming out. No change to the 75% rule as it pertains to outside teams with this closed and open season schedule. And new for this year's number of contests. You see here in front of you the sports of basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, tennis, and lacrosse. In the past, these sports were offered a number of regular season games plus a number of tournaments. We're no longer getting into how many tournaments you can or can't play. We're just limiting your number of games. You can play any combination of games through tournaments or regular season to reach your max. I'm a basketball coach and I want to schedule uh, four tournaments that have four games each and play 10 regular season games. That would be 16 tournament games and 10 regular season games. To reach my 26, that's fine. If I wanted to play 24 regular or 26 regular season games and no tournaments, that's fine. If I want to play in one four game tournament and 22 regular season games, that's fine. The key is that every time you play now, whether it's in a tournament or a regular season game, you count that as one contest. And remember that any contest you play in the preseason must be in a tournament. And that contest counts towards your total number of contests. So if you play in a preseason tournament for four games in that tournament, then you would subtract those four games from your total number. That would leave you with 22 games to play during the regular season. You cannot play a regular season game or a single game prior to the official start date of your regular season. Any games played prior to that official start date must be played through a preseason tournament. And remember, those games count towards your total number of contests. An athlete is limited to the same number of games as the team. So there's no combination that an athlete can exceed playing the max number a varsity team can play. Example, a ninth grader who plays softball would have 24 games. They could play at JV and then come up and play two games at the varsity level. Remember, dressed in uniform and on the bench or sideline area is considered participating. If I'm a girls basketball player and I wear a uniform and I sit on the bench for 25 games and I never go in, by our rules, you've considered participating in 25 games. Please keep that in mind as you move athletes up and down. Brackets. I want to take a minute to kind of walk you through how brackets come to be. Every year we get calls from coaches wanting to know the how or the why the brackets are the way they are, who set these brackets. Um, sometimes there's a misbelief that we set them in our office. So we'll take a minute to walk you through how brackets get to be brackets. Uh, first of all, by rule, brackets for the state championships are to be set by the commissioner. However, our commissioner currently allows each classification to structure and organize their brackets as it pertains to that classification. In other words, 5A gets to determine how many qualifiers from each region, what those region matchups in the playoffs will look like, and who will be designated the home team throughout the playoffs to the semifinals. 
each classification has the same opportunity to do that. So 1A through 5A has the opportunity to determine who qualifies, what those matchups will be in the playoffs, and then who the designated home team will be. Understand those brackets are set for a two-year period. They're set based on realignment. So those brackets are set in for two years. Brackets from this year should be different from the brackets that we see next year. The only thing that our office sets are the dates. With that, reminder that dates mu games must be played on the original scheduled date by the bracket. Should both teams agree, you can always move a game a day early. You can never move a game back for any reason unless it's a weather-related reason that causes us not to be able to play the game due to weather. Games must be played on the original scheduled date unless both schools agree to move it up a day. You can never move it back a day for any reason unless weather dictates you cannot play it on the original scheduled date. Okay, so once the, the bracket committee for each classification put together proposals, each principal and athletic director had an opportunity at the principals and ADs conference in March, and in some cases, in some classes, additional opportunities through email to have input into the brackets that will be used for the 18 to 2020 school years. Reminder, we're starting a new realignment period this fall, so you may have similar matchups in your brackets that you experienced this past year. An example of that, Team A went to Team B in the semifinal round during the 2017-18 school year. In the 2018-19 school year, Team A may go back to Team B in the semifinal round again. The reason for that is we're in a new realignment period. Names and faces and regions have changed. Region numbers have changed. Some schools have gone from the upper to the lower. Your classification is not the same classification that it was a year ago. Therefore, your brackets could dictate repeat matchups in the same rounds based on the fact that schools have changed. You could have gone from Region 3 to Region 4 and now end up playing the same team who's in 1, whereas you played them in 3 last year, but now you're in 4. You can understand why you could have similar matchups, but the brackets for this year are totally new and are set by each classification. If you have any questions on your brackets, talk to your athletic director. and They can direct those questions to the president of your classification. This concludes the first 10 slides that pertains to the South Carolina High School League information. I appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. This time I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner responsible for your sport. I wish you all best of luck during your season, and if you ever have any questions, feel free to contact our office. Welcome to the 2018 NFHS Football Rules PowerPoint. I'm Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner at South Carolina High School League. I oversee the sport of football in the fall. My email is charlie at schsl.org. And the office number is 803-798-0120. 803-798-0120. All right, before we get started in the new rule changes, a couple of reminders for South Carolina football this year. Keep your cameras rolling. Don't stop the cameras when a play's blown dead or when the uh, play comes to an end. Nine times out of ten, any altercation that takes place usually takes place once the ball uh, is blown dead by a whistle or it comes to an end um, and the play is over. Um, instruct your camera operators to keep the cameras rolling through three to four yards of separation, then hit pause, and then they can re-record starting on the next play. Coaches, we need to be more direct on our expectations for sportsmanship. Um, one of the areas that we were very um, concerned with last fall with our, our sportsmanship was the number of players leaving the bench area or the number of players becoming involved in an altercation. Um, we need to be very, very direct, uh, almost very clear 
and, and concise in what your expectations are. Remind your student athletes that showing good sportsmanship does not make them less of a player, doesn't make them less of a competitor, and that it really doesn't do anything negative for them. We don't want to get in situations of having to suspend kids, but be very direct in what you expect from them if an altercation were to take place. I've shared with you before, it's never a bad idea to stage an altercation during practice to see how your student athletes would react. New rule this year, you can dress on Friday, don't play. You can play in the sub varsity game Saturday or the immediate Monday following. Reminder that this is only if the varsity game's first. There's no opportunity to dress for a JV game, not play, and play the next day. Okay, that's only if the varsity game comes first. So if you dress for a varsity game, stay on the sideline, you don't go in for one play. You can turn around and play the whole game in the sub varsity game on Saturday or the immediate Monday following. This gives every coach the opportunity to reward kids uh, for their hard work, for their summer of hard work. You know they're not going to play much, play at all. They can stay on the sideline, they can wear the uniform, they can run through the tunnel, they can hear the band, mom can see them, daddy can see them. You just don't put them in. It also gives you the opportunity to have a kid there in the event you need them for an emergency, whether you need an emergency on the first play from scrimmage or in the middle of the third quarter. You're not tied to win. If you choose to use them in an emergency, you can. If the game becomes a blowout, it gives you the opportunity to play that, that young man or young lady earlier in the game and get them reps at the varsity level versus holding them out for the JV game the next day. A reminder, if they play in one play on Friday, they're not allowed to play any more games on Saturday or Monday. Another topic we continue to talk about, we need more officials. Encourage your former players to join the ranks of officials. We're not, we're not starving right now in terms of number of officials we've got, but we're not healthy. And um, every school would go out and recruit one new official. That would be 200 new officials. If we did that every year, we would be overly healthy for the next few years. We are one retirement group away from being several hundred officials down. Um, at any, any year now. We keep holding strong to about the same number of 600 plus officials, but at some point we're gonna start losing those that are aging out and we're gonna be down below 600 and closer to the number of 500. So we need your help in recruiting. This year, I appreciate those of y'all that have helped. We've had probably the highest number of officials sign up to do football. Now the goal is to keep them around and we need your help in doing that as well. So. When they come to your JV games, they don't know what they're doing. If they're trying to figure some things out at a middle school game, remember, they have to learn how to do it somewhere before we put them on the varsity level. Um, so be mindful of that. Remind your JV coaches. Remind your sub-varsity and middle school coaches. Be patient with the officials. In some cases, they're learning just as much as your coaches and players are learning too. A couple more reminders, um, player equipment, and you know, new rule this year addressing player equipment, but coaches, just a reminder that you're responsible for the players wearing equipment properly. Um, at the end of the day, if you allow them to wear equipment improperly at practice, they're probably going to wear it, want to wear it in games improperly. If you allow, allow them to walk out of locker room on Friday nights improperly dressed, they're, you're going to be held responsible. If you clamp down on them, it's not going to be a big deal come, come game time. Don't get mad at an official for doing their job and send the kid out of, off the field for being um, illegally equipped or wearing equipment illegally. So understand that it all can start and stop with you. You handle it. Don't let it get to the point where somebody else has to. The other responsibility of coaches, sideline management. Remember, coaches, you are responsible for those that are in your team box. The school is responsible for those on your sidelines. Last, last year or so, we've had way too many non-uniform, non-school personnel on the sidelines, yelling at officials, yelling at players on other teams, and in some cases have been the instigator in an altercation. Uh, a former player, a non-uniform community member, 
um, addressing officials disrespectfully or addressing players disrespectfully to the other team. You know, head coaches, if they're in your box, you're going to be responsible for them. If they're on your sideline, your school is going to be responsible. So be mindful of who has access to your sideline and who you're allowing down there and what they're saying. If you know you've got someone that's going to be volatile down there, tell them it's probably better for them to sit in the third row and be volatile than it is for them to stand three yards away. And just a final reminder, make sure the dressing facilities for your football officials are clean, secure, have chairs and showers. You get a lot of reports, especially early in the year, first few weeks where dressing facility wasn't clean. No way to lock the door. In some cases, we're having um, multi-use rooms where females, uh, student at, student cheerleaders or student trainers are coming in and out of the locker room while officials are trying to get dressed. This day and age, you're, you're setting up for a lawsuit um, and you're setting the officials up for a lawsuit, unfortunately, as much as yourself. But make sure that it's clean, it's secure, there's no one coming in and out, it's not a hallway, it's not a, an area we keep stuff, it's an area for just the five guys that are coming to do your game as an official. They have chairs, they have showers when the game's over. Um, and a place just to dress cleanly and, and leave their stuff during the contest. Okay, new rule change for 2018. We only have a few, so hang on tight here. Um, equipment rule, new this year. Reminder, coaches, you're responsible for verifying to the referee and another game official prior to the game that all your players are legally and properly equipped and will remain um, legally equipped throughout the contest. If you have any questions about legality of player equipment, these questions should be resolved by the umpire prior to this contest starting. When a um, player equipment that is required is missing or worn improperly, we'll declare an official's timeout. If that uh, missing or worn is equipment is detected during the down, or during a dead ball action related to the down without being directly attributed to a foul by an opponent or if a player is wearing otherwise illegal equipment in a legal manner, the player will be replaced for at least one down unless obviously we're at halftime or an overtime intermission occurs. If prompt repair is possible and does not delay the ready for play signal for more than 25 seconds, then that player should have the opportunity to replace the equipment. So basically if your player is not wearing equipment properly, legal equipment during the down or prior to the down, um, they're going to be replaced for one down. It's the same concept as the helmet coming off. This is just going to make it a lot easier to officiate not legally equipped, send them off the field. Coaches, don't don't share with us that you can't find pants that are longer. They're out there. They make them. Get them. Make sure all your players are legally and properly equipped before the game starts. Don't let this become an issue of somebody else having to deal with it. Take care of it yourself before you get there. All right, defenseless player rule 232.16a. Did you remember last year the defenseless player rule um, came in? They gave some examples of a defenseless player. One of the examples um, involved the um, player in the act of passing, which in reality the player who's in the act of passing the football is still by rule technically the runner. Therefore, you cannot be defenseless. Um, so that piece has been eliminated. It would be the, the passer, which is once the ball is released, and is caught or the play ends um, through an incomplete pass, he would be a defenseless player. Um, remember, that could also be a, um, a roughing the passer penalty or defenseless player penalty. So you're going to have the decision of a referee at that point in time. The third rule change for this year, the uh, signal for 6-3, um, 6-1-3-B penalty and the 6-1-4 penalty. Um, signal 19 is now going to be used um, 
when K players are more than five yards uh, behind the free kick line or um, when someone else kicks the ball or if you don't have at least four players on the other side of the kicker. Okay, so you're going to, same penalty now will apply to the fault start legal formation and free kick infraction or same penalty signal. Um, so just be, it's not going to change the number of yards, just be on the lookout for what signal they actually give. Okay, probably the biggest addition to um, penalty changes this year or rule changes this year, I apologize, is going to be the penalty enforcement for the rule change on the um, on free and scrimmage kicks. Um, R is going to have the opportunity to have an additional option when K fouls during a free or scrimmage kick down. Uh, remember, K is the kicking team, R is the receiving team. So K commits a foul during the kick, either on a free or a scrimmage kick. R is going to have the ability to enforce that from the succeeding spot, which will basically be the end of the play. So. I'm going to give you an example here in a second to help you clarify this a little bit further. But the effort or the, pur the purpose in this is to have an effort to reduce the number of kicks we have in a contest. Whereas before, many times, to get the penalty yardage out of the penalty, when you accepted it, you had to have the ball re kicked. So the whole goal here is to cut off the re kicking. Okay, hopefully this will help ease it up for you a little bit. Simplistic version here. Rule change that I just talked about. Basically on free kicks, if the ball goes out of bounds on the kick, um, you'll have an additional option added into the current options that are already there. So you already have several current options. This is going to give you an additional option um, to the ones that already exist, which will be a five-yard um, option um, from the succeeding spot. You currently have the five-yard penalty from the previous spot, and K would re-kick it. Um, you can also put the ball at play in bounds, 25 yards beyond beyond the previous spot, or you can decline the penalty and put the ball in play at the inbound spot. So if you kick the ball out at the 30-yard line on a kickoff. You can decline the penalty and take it at the 30. You can accept the penalty and take it um, with one option, add five yards to that at the 35. Or you can add 25 yards from the original um, kick. Or you can take the five yards on K and have them re-kick it. So it just adds an extra option in there for you. On free and scrimmage kick, on penalties, that are on K, which remember K is a kicking team. During the kick, you can accept those from the succeeding spot. An example would be if you have a, a hold during the kick on K, you could add that 10 yards on to the end of the play, which would be the succeeding spot there. So, And that's only if R is the next to put it in play. If R turns over the return and fumbles it back to K, then um, the option to take it from the succeeding spot is gone. Okay, here's an example um, of a play. You see the play pick there. Um, K has a foul during the kick. R actually returns this kick all the way for a touchdown. The foul occurred during the kick. And the succeeding spot's now actually the goal line because you have a touchdown that was scored. Um, to enforce the penalty in this situation from the succeeding spot, R would only have the option to enforce it on the try. Okay, had he not gone to the goal line and scored, had he gotten to the 20, then you could add that penalty onto the end of the play there from the succeeding spot. Here you have another example that I used with our officials earlier in the summer. You got a scrimmage kick. K is going to punt the ball from their own 40-yard line. 
the ball goes out of bounds at R's 20 yard line prior to ever being touched by R. Case flag for an illegal formation. Under the rule change, R will now have the following options. And it's a scrimmage kick, so let's just call it a punt. Make it easier for you to understand. A, the options that, that R would have would be to accept the five yard penalty for an illegal formation from the previous spot and have K re kick the ball from their 35. So they kicked it from the 40, take five yards, and um, re kick it from the 35. You could accept the five yard penalty for illegal formation from the succeeding spot and put the ball in play at R's 25 yard line. So it went out of bounds on the 20 here. Um, add five yards onto the end of that play, which would be another five yards, and get the ball in play on the 25. Or you could obviously decline the penalty and put the ball in play at the 20. I, I can't think of, and I've, and I've talked to some other people about this, I can't think of many or any situation, and if there is one, it's a really obscure one, where the R team is going to decline a penalty that on a foul by K during the kick. Um, every, every, every decline does not help the return team in any capacity. Every option you have to accept the penalty um, helps in some way. Okay, and here's another play pick example. Remember R has that additional option when K fouls during a free or scrimmage kick. Even though R fumbled in this play, um, R actually recovered this fumble and they will be the next to put it in play so they can enforce it from the succeeding spot. If R were to fumble and K had recovered, and it would be K's ball, then you would not apply this new penalty exception. All right, that covers the rule changes for this year. Let's, let's talk about some of the editorial changes for 2018. Again, reminder, editorial changes are not new rules. It's a, just a small um, change to the wording Sometimes a change of word, spelling of a word, a phrase, or a, a period, or exclamation point, or some other punctuation mark added in. But I'll go through those really quick with you. Okay, got a new signal editorial. Um, put in a new signal. Um, signal 26. Legal blindside block signal. This signal obviously will indicate an illegal blindside block. You'll see the fists bump together at chest level. So you'll see two fists bump together. Coaches, if you get that, then you know you had an illegal blindside block. Uh, your field diagrams in your rule book, um, they've updated some of the field markings on all the field diagrams. Under 137. They further clarify the use of supplementary equipment to aid in game administration authorized by the state association. Table 179, they change quarter to period. Rule 342C, they clarify when the clock will start on the snap if there is an inadvertent whistle following a change of possession. 352B and 355B. They added 3510E as an additional rules reference. And 36 penalty updated Article 2 based on the rule change to 362. And 512A, they added the word non player. Continued editorial changes 981J. They added the phrase using alcohol or any form of tobacco products, e cigarettes, or similar items. To Article 1 under non contact unsportsmanlike conduct by non players. The basic spot was clarified under 1047. Resolving tied games, the word quarter was changed to period. Under football officials' signals, a free kick infraction was added to signal 19, and they added targeting to signal 24. Penalty summary. Rules and references were updated and the legal helmet was added. In the index they updated rules references. Again these are editorial changes 
um, for 2018. Additional rule changes for editorial, or I say editorial changes. All right, 2018 NFHS football points of emphasis. Points of emphasis for this year, properly wearing and use of required equipment. Of course, we have a rule change dealing with equipment. Pace of play and timing issues. Enforcement of penalties for personal fouls and unsportsmanlike conduct fouls. And defenseless player and blindside blocks. Remember, prior to the start of each game, the head coach verifies that all players are legally and properly equipped. Everyone should be equipped correctly to reduce the risk of injury. Players should wear helmets, face masks, tooth protector, jersey. Uh, remember, you remember the length of the jerseys, that they don't go below the belt. If they do, they're tucked in and they make it to the belt. So. And remember, the knee pad should cover the knee. There's been a little bit of concern across the country, not so much from, from our state, but across the country in terms of the pace of play of the game of football. Uh, one of the things that we know can be controlled is how long the referee waits to uh, give the ready for play signal. Coaches remember that Referees should give the ready for play signal between 12 to 15 seconds um, from when the ball is dead on the previous play. So the ball is dead from the previous play. You should have 12 to 15 seconds from when the ready for play uh, signal is given. Enforcement of penalties for personal fouls and unsportsmanlike conduct fouls. Coaches remember that Illegal personal contact fouls involve potential for injury to an opponent. Unsportsmanlike conducts are non-conduct fouls, so personal fouls are going to have contact with them. This is very important for you to remember because if you have a player who is given a non-contact unsportsmanlike conduct foul, on the second unsportsmanlike conduct, they will be ejected. You can actually commit multiple personal conduct fouls and not be ejected. Now, obviously, there are cases of personal conduct fouls where you would be ejected if it's deemed to be flagrant. But you can compete. You can actually con commit multiple personal conduct fouls that are personal fouls without being ejected. Don't let an official give one of your student athletes an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty for what is essentially a personal foul. If you have contact, it's going to be a personal foul. Non-contact, it's going to be unsportsmanlike. Remember last year, Rules defining and giving examples of defenseless players and prohibiting forceful blindside blocks. Obviously, with that being a rule change last year, it's still going to be a point of emphasis this year. Remember to execute an appropriate blindside block outside the free blocking zone. You must do so initiating contact with open hands. Coaches, you teach these blocks correctly or teach them not to execute illegally, illegal blocks shouldn't have any problems with, with these plays being called against you. All right, 2018 football rule reminders. Remember last year the permissible items on balls? The ball can contain the manufacturer's logo, uh, school name logo or mascot, the conference name or logo, or the state association name or logo. And then obviously NFHS name or logo. Any other um, sponsorships or ads on the ball are illegal. Here's just a picture of the jerseys. As you can see, jersey A is a white jersey, which would be illegal away jersey. 
B and C are shades of gray from the manufacturer. And reminder, in 2021, they will be illegal jerseys to wear as a gray option, as a dark jersey. D, that, that deep metal gray that you see in D will still be able to be worn as a home option, but C and B will not be any, anymore beginning 2021. If you've purchased jerseys ahead of time, several years out, and you've bought a B or C version to wear at home, you better get all the wear you can out of them between now and 2020. Because in 2021, you're not going to be able to wear them. But here's an example of that um, home team jerseys of what will and won't be accepted. As you can see, jerseys A, B, and C beginning in 2021 will not be able to be worn as a home jersey. Um, a obviously being a white jersey, B being a lighter gray, and C being a little bit darker gray than B, but not quite as dark as what's required to be a home jersey. D would still be a legal home jersey. That deep metal gray would be legal um, as well. I told you last year, be mindful of this as you're ordering jerseys because I know many of you buy football uniforms several years in advance. So if you've purchased some C's, plan on wearing them at home, or wearing them at all, you need to clearly make sure you get it all the wear out of them you can between now and the end of the 2020 season because in 2021, you're not going to be able to wear C. We talked about it in the um, rules a little bit this year, the rule change, and then obviously in the point of emphasis, but a rule reminder from last year is a blindside block. Remember that blindside block is against an opponent other than the runner. Does not see the blocker approaching. Remember it will be a legal block. You can do this if you lead with open hands. On the blind side block, remember it occurs outside the free blocking zone on an opponent other than a runner. Can't see it coming, don't have a reasonable opportunity to see it coming. And there's a reminder again, you see right here in the play pick, this block was forceful but it was initiated with open hands thus making it legal here's the pop-up kick rule from last year pop-up kicks a free kick in which the kicker drives the ball immediately into the ground ball strikes the ground once and goes into the air in a manner of the ball kick directly off the tee there'll be a dead ball foul you cannot teach this. Don't teach it. Eliminate it. Shouldn't have an option with it. Remember the game clock option. Less than two minutes and a half. And the game clock's running. Uh, the offended team may choose to start the game clock on the snap. Referee's going to come to the offended team and ask if you want to start the game clock on the snap inside of two minutes of each half. However, the player has a prosthetic um, limb that comes completely off. The ball becomes dead and the down ends. This is when the ball or, or the player, come, the limb comes off the runner. Any other player, we're going to continue. If the runner has a prosthetic limb that comes completely off, the ball's going to become immediately dead and the down's going to end. Here's the ready for play signal, the encroachment rule from last year. Um, you got the ready for play signal. Snapper's in contact with the ball. As encroachment, if a defensive player contacts the ball or the snapper's arms or hands until the snap is completed. pass interference rule that was passed last year. Face guarding without contact in itself is no longer considered pass interference. Remember, you can face guard if there is no contact. 
So it's a big stride for defensive uh, rules to help um, give the defense opportunities to defend the pass. So face guarding without contact is in itself legal. That concludes the 2018 rule presentation. I'd like to thank you all for your time going through these rules. I wish you best of luck in your 2018 football season. Obviously, if you have any questions about anything we've gone over in the PowerPoint, please give us a call. Our number here, 803-798-0120. And again, my name is Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner at the South Carolina High School League. I'll be happy to help you at any point during the season. Again, thank you and best of luck.